the rest of the of the lecture actually is just a little bit of honing down on RCT and getting to understand RCT. This is um, this is a figure that uh, comes in many books, and basically it's showing you the different phases of RCT. And uh, by now, you, I'm hoping that you're kind of familiar with the different phases. So on the phase one, phase two, phase three, and then post market marketing, you could have phase four. And while phase one is focusing on safety, phase two focuses on efficacy, and phase three uh, looks at dosing versus population studies, etc. Um, at a certain point in time in this class, we're going to talk about the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, and how these two concepts are different. So let's talk about um, the types of trial. So phase one, uh, it's a small sample size. Uh, it's done after animal studies. It addresses safety mainly. Uh, there's no randomization, and usually it's it's uh, people that these are volunteers that are otherwise healthy. Phase two come in. The sample size is not very clear. It's not very big. I'm sorry. Uh, the dose you, you're trying to figure out the dose and the efficacy. Uh, the people that you recruited now they have the disease. They have uh, uh, whatever you're trying to 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 quote unquote cure. And mostly nothing randomization. Whereas phase three, that's where you look at efficacy and effectiveness. And I'm going to talk about Shulfara bin efficacy and effectiveness in a few slides. And there should be randomization. So that's your RCT. Okay. Now, phase four is done post marketing. We come in, it's called phase four. And it come in, it's an RCT. So come in for randomization, for control, for. Uh, fee intervention, but it's done after the, study, the, the drug has been approved and released in the market, and it's done for a different reason than just figuring out efficacy and, and effectiveness. Um, RCTs ought to be registered. There are many registries, uh, and this is in accordance to the Health Sinki Declaration. Actually, Lebanon recently created its own registry of RCT within the Ministry of Public Health and uh, I think it's devel developed with the WHO and that's a must. If you want to publish the results of an RCT, you have to register it. And basically registration means that you're going to make your results available um, online for free for everybody while your study is going on. And the idea is in case you didn't actually find positive results, then uh, you don't bury your results. You have to put them available for people to look at them. Sometimes studies, RCTs, are terminated early, and that could be of two reasons. Yeah, uh, there are some sort of concerns, the adverse reactions, the uh, people dying, uh, and then for safety reasons, the study is stopped early. Or it's the other way around. Maybe the, the effect is so strong, the benefit is so... Uh, evident that you figure out that there's no need for you to continue your study with an RCT. So you maybe thought you need to recruit 5,000 patients, but by the time you recruited 2,000 patients, the, the impact of your drug is so strong that you have enough power to, to show that the drug works, and, and therefore there's no need to continue recruiting people and putting them into a placebo and an intervention. Uh, you could just, you know, come, come, uh, come out with your uh, with, the, with your results as is and report them to uh, the, the FDA. Okay, um, consort statement, I highly encourage you to go to consort.org. Um, this is uh, consort is consortium of uh, randomized trial and basically what you have there is a list of questions that by asking and answering the question, you can figure out if the study, if the randomized clinical trial has addressed all the elements that it should address. Um, and we're going to do an exercise if we have the time to do that. We're going to do an exercise towards the end of the semester where I'm going to give you an RCT paper to read, and I'm going to print out the consort statements. And basically, these are multi these are like questions after questions, and you have to find the answer. And all you do is you just specify is a yes, they did it or not, and which page that they talk about it. So, like for example, the first question is, does it say it's an RCT in the title? And if it does say it's an RCT in the title, you'd write yes, and you'd say it's in the title. Um, so somewhere else they say, did they randomize participants? And did they say, did they tell you how they randomized? And if the paper says 
says so, and then you say yes, and you indicate in, in which section of the paper they did that. So consort, uh, highly encourage you to, to, to check it out. Now, the different types of clinical trials, final, um, and I should say trials, and a clinical trials, and a field trial, and an explanatory trial, and a pragmatic trial, and um, uh, an article published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology says that the majority of trials are explanatory and pragmatic. Fee superiority trials, these are the trials that you were used to. They are trying to show that the treatment is superior to the placebo fee equivalence trial. This is where you're trying to show that the genetic is as good as the uh, the the non uh, the the, tri the original um, so all you have to show in this type of trial is that as good as you don't have to show that it's better so we talk about equivalence trial Fee another type of trial is called non inferiority trials and therefore here you're trying to show that the 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 genetic is actually non-inferior to the brand. Uh, not that it's equal, it's just non-inferior. And every one of these have their own way of doing the, the, uh, the analysis. So here I'm just going to point out that for equivalency, I have the slide that kind of like explain, explain it, where you have in, right in the middle zero, meaning that no difference. And on one side, there is non-equivalency favoring the, the one treatment. On the other side, you have non-equivalency favoring the other treatment. And anything that falls within a certain margin of error could be considered as equivalent. Amma inferiority, since you're only inter interested in showing that it's non-inferior, that uh, you only look at one side. And uh, you can see here that it's showing inferior. All you care is that you don't fall into in that region. As long as you are within the blue area, then you can talk about non-inferiority and that your results are showing non-inferior. Uh, blinding, you probably know about blinding. So there's single double blinding. And, and so double blinding, you know, you, don't, you, you blind the participant and you blind the, the person doing the assessment of the outcome. Triple blinding is basically you're blinding the people doing the... Uh, the analysis of your results so that they don't kind of like cheat. Um, uh, quadruple blinding, you also blind the, 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 the administrator of the treatment, etc. So usually it's, sing, it's double blinding, triple blinding, uh, you, you blind the statistician. Uh, so when it comes to analysis, and we're going to talk about this, there are different types of analysis that relate to what you want to look at. Fichy analysis is more intention to treat analysis. Fichy is more per protocol analysis. Fichy is, and, and these relate to whether you're doing efficacy versus effectiveness, and therefore whether you're interested in internal validity versus external validity. So what is efficacy versus effectiveness? Efficacy if the drug works, regardless of anything else. So under ideal condition, does the drug work? And if the drug works, this is efficacy. Whereas effectiveness, if it's efficacy plus the other things that happens, uh, like human factors. So maybe the drug works, but the pill is too big, so people don't like to take it. It has a very weak taste. People uh, skip a dose. It has side effects. So if under ideal condition, the drug works, but in real life, people don't take it the way they were supposed to take it. Now, an example that I will talk about is maybe there is a drug that works, but you have to take it 17 times during 24 hours, and you have to wake up in the middle of the drug, of the day to take it, in the uh, middle of the, of the night, I'm sorry, to take it. And that is not just going to happen. People are not going to wake up multiple times to, uh, in the middle of the night. Therefore, efficacy, this drug is efficacious in endo-efficacy, but it's not effective, yanimando effectiveness. So effectiveness is efficacy plus other factors, human factors, uh, you know. And so, uh, therefore, if, if you think about these two concepts, um, when you do any clinical trial, you're trying to try to find the ideal condition as much as possible. Therefore, your study has a lot of internal validity. Okay, you, you, you're controlling everything. You're trying to think to, 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 to wash out or to eliminate any type of potential confounder or bias. Therefore, your study is well controlled. It has what we call internal validity, and you're able to measure the efficacy of your drug. But 
can you generalize can you generalize your results to the population well if you've done a lot of controlling then the condition you're studying becomes unrealistic and therefore your results cannot be widely generalized maybe you put too much uh, inclusion exclusion criteria and therefore the group of people that participated do not represent the entire population uh, of disease. Therefore, external validity is what we call generalizability. Uh, the more you can generalize your results, the more it has external validity, which takes us back to what is intention to treat analysis versus per protocol. Well, let's start per protocol. Per protocol analysis is when you compare uh, th those that followed the protocol in the intervention group to those that followed the protocol in the treatment group. And therefore, any deviations are taken out. Only those that followed 100% the protocol in the treatment and only those that followed the, the, the control are compared. And therefore, you're measuring efficacy. Okay? You're, 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 you're looking at um, take out any other effect. Just look at the drug itself. Therefore, you're, you're measuring efficacy. And that intention to treat, it says, well, you know, in real life, people might stop taking the drug. You may have people shifting from one arm to the other. So... As long as you've been randomized to taking the treat to taking the treatment, you'll be considered treatment. And as long as you've been randomized to taking the placebo, you'll be considered placebo, even though you never took the treatment. I know it happens in, in, in studies. You may have somebody that has been randomized to taking the treatment, but they, they never got to take the treatment. Oh, they were randomized to taking the placebo, but because the situation de uh, started degrading, they shift them into the treatment or they had them do surgery or they had them do something that was not part of the study. Intention to treat says anybody that once randomized to be in the treatment will be maintained in the treatment for the analysis and everybody that was randomized for the, for the placebo will be maintained in the placebo for the analysis regardless of what happened later on. Therefore, here you're comparing like more what happens in real life and therefore this is a you, uh, you're trying to look at effectiveness more than looking at efficacy, okay? So intention to treat looks at effectiveness, which kind of like, ref which kind of ties up with external validity. Whereas per protocol, you focus on efficacy, which also kind of tie, tie up with internal validity. Well, this is uh, the conclusion of uh, this lecture. I hope um, it, it, it was clear and I hope I tr uh, you, you understood the material. If you have any questions, you can uh, bring your question to class or you can email.